and um, good. So it's All recording right. now. It's brilliant. So thank you very much for to everyone um, for uh, attending this webinar. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to have a, a eminent uh, a neurosurgeon as Dr. Boop uh, kindly giving us this lecture on uh, surgical approaches to tumors near eloquent cortex in children. Dr. Boop is uh, uh, one of the leaders, uh, preeminent pediatric neurosurgeons and uh, neurosurgeon in um, uh, brain tumors. And um, his practice, I had had the honor of visiting in St. Jude's and spending a month with him is uh, impressive. And I would recommend anyone who is interested in pediatric tumors to visit there, who they do about 180 pediatric tumors a year. Uh, so without ado, I will let uh, Dr. Uh, Boop educate us on this very important area. Thank you, Dr. Boop. Well, thank you, Naren. Um, live from Memphis, Tennessee, and I'd like to thank Naren for putting together this international listserv uh, lecture series. I think it's a, a major advance for those of us in the world. In the background on the title slide, you see here St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, which is our major cancer uh, center for children. And then off in the corner of the slide is Le Bonheur Children's Hospital, which is our quaternary referral center. And it's at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital that we do our surgery and have our interoperative MRI. Uh, the children then get followed and receive adjuvant therapy at St. Jude. So by way of background, when we think about brain tumors in children, I remember that about half of them recur, occur in the posterior fossa and half of them are supratentorial. When we think about premature death in children, the number one cause of death in children is accident or injury, but the number two cause is cancer. Historically, the leading cause of cancer in children was cancer death in children was leukemia, but with advances in leukemia treatment over the past decades, most of those children now survive. So now the leading cause of cancer death in children is a brain tumor. And uh, the number one malignant tumor in childhood is the medulloblastoma. We'll not be talking about that today. We'll be talking more about the, uh, the cortical tumors, uh, particularly low-grade gliomas. But at the end, I'll also talk about some high-grade gliomas and their management. So when we think about cancer in adults, we see a picture like this. We know that this individual has had decades of exposure to uh, sunlight, radiation, obesity, uh, alcohol, cigarettes, things that can damage DNA and can cause acquired uh, cancer because of DNA damage. But when we see a child who presents with cancer, they don't have the opportunity to acquire those DNA mutations. So we have to consider the fact that many of those will have uh, congenital mutations, either within the tumor cells themselves or perhaps germline mutations. And so in evaluating a child with cancer, we have to pay particular attention to a history. So for example, Here's a child that presents with a brainstem tumor, and you at first glance say, well, this is a DIPG, but if you look closer, this is a sharply circumscribed brainstem tumor that we're seeing there. And in taking a history in this child, he had an eight-year-old cousin with rhabdomyosarcoma. He had another cousin with leukemia. And so that smacks of a cancer predisposition syndrome. And when we biopsied this tumor, it turned out to be a PNET of the brainstem and not a DIPG. So a PNET, um, we're more amenable to recommending surgery and then a different formulation of chemotherapy and radiation than what we would do for DIPG. So anytime we get a family history of cancer in 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, young people, then it should make us think about genetic testing and uh, cancer predisposition syndromes. In this case, the leaf romani has now been worked out fully, and um, uh, this blue area is the area of mutation that is responsible for the formation of brain tumors. So when we look at, uh, at survival from low-grade gliomas in children, you can see quite 
this uh, publication from a number of years ago by Jeff Wissoff in neurosurgery, looking at over 600 children followed for over a decade. And those that have hemispheral tumors do quite well. Those with midline gliomas, which are less amenable to resection and more likely to have nowadays histone mutations don't do nearly as well. So we'll talk today about this group of cere cerebral hemispheral tumors and some of the new mapping techniques that we can use to help us make surgery safer and improve outcomes in these children. Remember that malignant cerebral gliomas in children less than three traditionally carry a very poor prognosis. The infants can't carry, uh, can't tolerate much in the way of chemotherapy, and most of us are hesitant to radiate young children. But David Ellison, our neuropathologist, makes the point that histology does not predict biology very well in children less than a year of age. So here, for example, is a case of a child who was a born uh, following a normal pregnancy and at birth was noted to have a bulging fontanelle. This led to an ultrasound at the bedside showing a large right hemispheral tumor and the infant otherwise appeared to be healthy. So this is her MRI scan, but you can see here where the neurosurgeons did a burr hole and biopsy, and the pathology of this tumor was glioblastoma. So based on that, this child was sent home on palliative care. The family was told that the child would die. And after a month, the child was still feeding well. The head was growing across percentiles, but the infant still was wide awake and looked like a normal baby. So the family came down and recognizing that these congenital infantile glioblastomas have a much better prognosis, we gave one round of chemotherapy to reduce the vascularity of this tumor and then took it out. And here's her MRI several years later. Uh, she's never had recurrence after chemotherapy, did not require radiation therapy. And here's Abby now with her brother going to school. She has a congenital hemiparesis and hemianopsia, but otherwise a very functional child. So keep in mind that even though a prognosis may sound terrible in children less than two years of age, uh, that may not be the case. Likewise, we'll see benign histologies in children that are young, such as pilocytic astrocytomas, that may metastasize and act like a much more aggressive tumor. So biology is not predicted by histology in infants. In terms of functional mapping, historically one of the first things that uh, neurosurgeons began doing or neurologists began doing was the WADA test, first described by June WADA back in 1949, which was the intracarotid injection of, of a short-acting barbiturate to put one hemisphere to sleep at a time. And initially, this was used to determine laterality of language. Uh, then in 1962, the Montreal group began looking at memory function and hippocampal reserve in patients undergoing uh, temporal lobectomy for epilepsy. And that has stood as the, quote, gold standard um, for decades, even though it really wasn't scientifically validated until recent years. And there are a lot of problems with the uh, WADA test, which has caused us to move forward. So nowadays, when we look at functional imaging, here, for example, is a study where the authors looked at functional MRI and the WADA test to see which was a better predictor of outcome in patients, patients undergoing anterior temporal lobectomy for epilepsy. And you can see in the imaging here, not only are you looking at which hemisphere memory and speech are lateralized to, but you can even see which area of the cortex is involved. And indeed, these authors were able to demonstrate that uh, functional MRI in a uh, activation um, re name recognition task was a better predictor of postoperative verbal memory function than was the WADA test. This is also a, a, a meta-analysis of a number of studies published on the same topic demonstrating that out of 442 patients in 23 studies that the fMRI is an excellent non-invasive alternative to the WADA test such that we've pretty much quit doing WADA tests in children nowadays. And it's interesting that when they find discordance between the uh, functional MRI and the WADA test, it's often because uh, 
up to 15% of patients have bilateral language representation, whereas with the WADA test, we only can recognize unilateral language function. So when we look at um, brain mapping, non-invasive brain mapping paradigms, typically what they involve is recording images in an activated state versus a resting state, activated state versus resting state, and then, then using subtraction algorithms to subtract the activated signal from the resting state sig uh, noise and then superimposing that signal on an MRI or a CT so that we can see which region shows changes. And so, for example, with functional MRI, remember that we're looking at bold signal, which is blood oxygen level dependent, and so we're actually measuring focal changes in cortical perfusion that uh, respond to metabolic activation of the brain in that area. And in order for functional MRI to be reliable, we, it relies upon the integrity of the blood, of the, uh, of the autoregulatory system of the vasculature. This means that when you have high flow fistulas, you have large tumors with mass effect and edema, or you have the luxury of perfusion that performs in a postictal state, that bold signal may not be reliable. And it, this may not be the best way to measure functional brain mapping in patients with those sorts of uh, pathologies. Uh, we became interested in functional MRI uh, uh, looking at resting passive range of motion versus active range of motion after this study in 2007 from Tübingen, Germany, in which they identified uh, co-localization of active and passive range of motion in a number of young adults and children in the awake state with normal brains. And we said, well, if they can demonstrate co-localization in normal brains in awake patients, could we do the same in children who are sedated um, under propofol or natural sleep and uh, use this as a paradigm to map children who are un other otherwise unable to cooperate with um, uh, normal paradigms. So here's one of the first patients that we tested who had recurrent astrocytoma here. And uh, you can see this was an 18 year old who was able to cooperate, but looking at active versus passive range of motion, you see co-localization. Uh, even though the signal was more robust in the activated state than in the passive state. Here's another child who is actually a three-year-old daughter of one of our uh, pediatric surgeons who presented with new onset focal motor seizures involving her dominant hand and had this cortical lesion here. And under propofol sedation, you can see quite nicely activation of her uh, hand area of the motor strip and showing that it, those... Uh, Functional areas were a sulcus away from this benign cortical tumor, which at resection proved to be meningioangiomatosis. And uh, she, we were able to resect that with no deficit. She's over a decade out from surgery now with no recurrence and uh, no seizures. So we tried to extend this technology to visual paradigms. And you can see this child who is an index case St. Jude was doing work in infants with retinoblastoma, sedating them and looking at visual paradigms with functional MRI. And you can see that this child has had an enucleation here, but even in this one-year-old child under sedation, they were able to use a mirror to flash an alternating checkerboard on the retina and get a nice response from visual cortex. And you can see a more robust response contralateral to the normal eye than you see uh, contralateral to the enucleated eye. So we said, can we use this for patients that uh, have visual cortex lesions? Uh, the paradigm involved uh, 120 lux that was focused on the retina, eight hertz alternating block design, 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off, 10, minute, 10 images per epoch. So you see here a uh, three-year-old with tuberous sclerosis and occipital epilepsy, developmentally delayed, very hyperactive, unable to cooperate for any kind of functional testing, but under uh, propofol sedation, we're able to demonstrate the visual cortex in this child, and we can see the tubers in relation to the visual cortex above and below it. 
and uh, you can see here. Uh, then placed depth electrodes around the major tubers and were able to remove those. This is the child prone tentorium here, Falx here, this larger tuber resected from here, smaller tuber resected from here. And on post imaging, you can see preservation of the visual cortex and preservation of the hemifield in this child who could otherwise not cooperate. Here's another case of a 10 year old who presented with complex partial seizures related to this parahippocampal lesion here. History of Asperger's, very hyperactive, left-handed, and this is the right hemisphere. So we didn't know if speech was in this hemisphere or not. And you can see the lesion here coming back all the way to uh, visual cortex. And so here's his sedated functional MRI for visual. And from this, we can see the visual tracts, genicular calcarine tracts, and demonstrate that those tracts were stretched around the tumor here, allowing us to design an interhemispheric approach for resection of this tumor, which proved to be a grade one astrocytoma. And he's a decade out now, uh, continues to have well-controlled seizures and no recurrence, but preservation of his visual field. Here's another case of a 16-year-old who presented with seizures and uh, this tumor in his dominant temporal lobe. And like all 16-year-olds, his goal was to get a driver's license. Well, to do that, he had to be both seizure-free and to have intact visual fields. So this is his functional MRI, and you can see the tumor here, and this is Wernicke's area draped over the top of the tumor genicular calcarine tract making up the medial border to the tumor, corticospinal tracts really not involved, uh, and then arcuate fasciculus uh, around the uh, medial border of the tumor as well. And so with this information, we could design an approach to this tumor from anteriorly that allowed us to resect what turned out to be a ganglioglioma. And here is his follow-up scan several years after surgery preservation of his genicular calcarine tract here, and he's seizure-free and off medication now, has his driver's license. So here's an interesting case of a four-year-old who came to us. His mother is actually a neurosurgical intensive care nurse, and she uh, noticed that her son was having focal motor seizures several times per day, so brought with her this cell phone video that she captured of a seizure. And you can see tonic deviation of the eyes to the left, twitching of the left side of the face. Um, and he's, it's over like that. The remarkable thing about this seizure is that there's no involvement of the shoulder. There's no involvement of the arm. It's all limited strictly to the face. And here's his MRI. So at first glance, you'd say wedge shaped, hypo intense. This is most likely going to be uh, at DNET, but looking at further imaging, you see this shaggy signal abnormality around it, extending down to the ventricle. You see expansion of the gyri uh, superiorly, making us wonder if this was not some sort of low-grade tumor within an area of dysplasia. And on further imaging, extended even through the uh, corpus callosum and into the thalamus, as you see here. So here's his tractography seated off of the hand area. And you'll notice that the tumor is premotor at the level of the hand area, and then comes back to involve primary motor strip at the level of the face. Um, and this is transcranial magnetic stimulation, again, showing where the omega is on imaging, which normally would denote the hand area of the motor strip, and this is confirmed by his TMS. So here again, tumor is in the premotor area coming back into the motor strip down to the sylvian fissure. So no matter what kind of intraoperative stimulation we do, we know that anatomically we need to spare the motor strip and the tracts, but we can also predict that if we resect premotor, that he's going to wake up with um, with a hemiparesis uh, related to resection of premotor area, but we can also tell the family that over six to eight weeks that that'll recover and it should go away with therapy.
So here at surgery, you can see that omega sign, the hand area of his motor strip. You can see tumor sw swollen gyri here in the premotor area coming back to involve the inferior motor strip in the face area. And we know that face, face has bilateral cortical representation. So even though he'll wake up with facial and may have swallowing difficulty, that that will recover over time. So here's our resected specimen, which is tumor. Here's preservation of that hand area resection of the uh, motor strip down to the sylvian fissure, biopsies of that feathery area deep to the tumor came back gliosis with no tumor seen, and histology on this came back consistent with a low-grade oligodendroglioma. So here's his post-resection scan. This is the area we took the biopsies from. And of course, he woke up hemiplegic, uh, had facial as well, but here he is, three months after surgery, playing on the playground. Hey, buddy, go for it. But what if I fall? It's okay. Everybody falls. You just got to get back up, okay? And uh, here's fine motor. And I would suggest to you that looking at this video, it would be hard to tell which side the resection had been on. So, uh, this is a six-year-old who presented with seizures and had this cortical tumor. And again, based on imaging, that wedge shape and the bubbly appearance made us think DNET. Uh, dominant uh, temporal lobe, but fairly far forward on the temporal lobe. And uh, functional mapping suggested that her speech area was behind that tumor in the superior uh, temporal gyrus. But DNETs in general are confluent tumors that will infiltrate, uh, that will not infiltrate brain, but will displace it. The point I'd like to make with this case is that generally low grade tumors will be limited by a sulcus and they will grow until confluent uh, up until a sulcal pia, and they may grow under the pia and up the other side, but typically they don't grow across a peel boundary. Malignant gliomas, glioblastomas are a different story. They'll grow across the sylvian fissure, they'll grow across peel boundaries, but typically low-grade tumor, uh, tumors are confined. So here you can see the tumor at surgery, you can see the expanded gyri, and so our technique for resecting these is going to be wagulating the pia over the uh, tumor, not over the normal brain, and then trying to preserve any significant on passage vessels. Professor Yastergill has told us, taught us very nicely that most of the deficits that occur with resection of low-grade gliomas are from compromise of the of the uh, blood flow to the surrounding cortex and not from resecting the tumor. So if we can preserve those vessels, then we're likely to preserve function in the surrounding brain. So you can see here the tumor dissecting away from the pia, trying to leave the peel vessels intact uh, down in the sulcus over the normal brain so that we don't vital devitalize the cortex in the sulcus, but taking it away from the tumor. And as we work circumferentially around the tumor, uh, following the sulcal plane down to the depth, generally we're either able to measure a depth by preoperative MRI or notice a textural or visual difference between the low-grade glioma and the normal subcortical white matter until we get all the way around the tumor. And once we've circumscribed the tumor, taking it away from the subjacent pia, uh, then we can lift it out and uh, have a specimen. Uh, it may uh, infiltrate a, an adjacent gyrus, as you see here, and we may have to amputate at that level. But generally, we've taken the vascular supply away, and I will always do a biopsy of the white matter underneath the low-grade glioma for permanent pathology so we can tell if there's residual uh, tumor at that level or not. A word on magnetoencephalography. This uses uh, uh, 
a number of superconductors, squids to triangulate electrical activity. So rather than uh, measuring changes in focal cortical perfusion like we do with fMRI, magnetoencephalography actually measures pooled neuronal activity and again is a non-invasive measure uh, that will triangulate using pretty much the same mathematical algorithms as GPS where these electrical signals come from and then making an EEG map which can be superimposed on an MRI, so MSI is magnetic source imaging, which is the superimposition of a uh, MEG signal on an MRI. And we can use this to uh, do functional mapping with visual paradigms, auditory paradigms, uh, sensory and motor paradigms as you see here. It's also an excellent modality in patients who have seizures associated with tumors to see where the interictal abnormalities come from. So here's an example of a 14-year-old who came to us with what she called crazy speak. She was having episodes where she could see her friends talking to her but couldn't understand what they were saying. And on her CAT scan, she had this calcified tumor in the subcortical area. On MRI, you can see it in this dominant sylvian fissure. And you can see quite nicely her MEG dipoles, which are interictal abnormalities confined to the superior temporal gyrus on the side of her tumor. And then her language paradigm showing tightly circumscribed language responses, language activation right around her tumor. So based on this information, and here's pure tones right against the tumor, uh, we've used a transsulcal uh, approach to follow blood vessel, open up the sylvian fissure. Here's her tumor, um, middle cerebral branches stuck to it, but were able to be dissected free. And here's her post-operative scan showing resection of a grade one astrocytoma with no uh, speech deficits and her seizure subsequently resolved after that. So this is uh, work from Andy Pippin, Papanicolaou at our place looking at MEG in relationship to the WADA test and just demonstrating a high level of concordance with MEG for language, um, uh, and in, in cases where it was not concordant, it was typically because patients by MEG were noted to have bilateral language representation. So again, we said, well, can we use this as a way to measure language areas in children who are too young to cooperate for a functional paradigm? And so we've developed a a, a paradigm using MEG where we can sedate children in the MEG unit with either, either propofol, versed, or natural sleep, and then through earbuds have a computer generate 180 words at 85 decibels, and with that get a very nice response from Wernicke's area down to a year of age, even, even below a level at which their language has developed. So here's a case of a three-year-old with intractable complex partial seizures. You see on the normal side, a normal gray-white differentiation in this temporal lobe, absent in this temporal lobe, which is suspicious for cortical dysplasia. Seizures seem to arise from that temporal lobe. And here you can see in Meg, all of his language responses with him under sedation were in the right hemisphere, even though the child appeared to be right-handed. All of his interictal abnormalities were in the left. Um, and uh, again, you can see all the language responses in the right temporal region. So we went on to perform a temporal lobectomy in that child, and he's grown up to have normal language, and indeed, he proved to have cortical dysplasia at that time. Another case, this is an eight-year-old born with congenital hemiparesis, initially thought to be a brachial plexus palsy until the child began seizing at seven months of age, and that led to an MRI showing this congenital middle cerebral infarct. And because she was intractable, we had recommended a functional hemispherectomy. Mother said, well, how do you know if you do a hemispherectomy of her left hemisphere, you're not going to ruin her language? Her language was fairly normal. So here's a MEG map of her responses under sedation. And you can see all of her language responses in the normal hemisphere, all of her interictal abnormalities in the left hemisphere. And she went on to a functional hemispherotomy, as you see here, with no damage to her language, but seizure freedom since that time. A word on transcranial magnetic stimulation. TMS 
navigated TMS uh, uses basically a model like you use for frameless stair taxi here and the patient wears a reflective headband that allows you to co-register the patient's head to the model on the stealth and then these ring electromagnets to stimulate the cortex transcutaneously and then the computer will mark on the uh, brain map where you're stimulating. Uh, this is an article, early article by Pict from several years ago that uh, got us interested in direct cortical stimulation transcutaneously in children. And we've been able to use this down to children five years of age. Sometimes we have to admit them to hospital a few days early and let child life work with them. But typically if they're sitting in mother's lap, uh, they can cooperate. And uh, this is a very good test for mapping out Broca's area in a child. So here's a case of a 14-year-old who presented with this focal cortical tumor, uh, new onset seizures, normal speech, normal cognition. And you can see here on DTI that this looks like a tumor that displaces functional tracts. This is his TMS. The gray shows no language responses over his tumor, but all of his language seems to be limited to the gyrus just behind the tumor in the frontal operculum. And then we replicated that information both with functional MRI showing a language response here, nothing from within the tumor, and MEG here showing language response just behind the tumor. And with those three modalities, what we call trimodality mapping, one of which is looking at focal blood flow, MEG looking at uh, neuronal activation, and TMS looking at direct cortical stimulation transcutaneously, we were very comfortable resecting that uh, under this patient asleep. And you can see our interoperative 3T MRI here showing complete resection of the tumor, but preservation of the gyrus where his speech lived, and he has perfectly normal speech postoperatively. Here's another case. This is an eight-year-old who had had partial resection of this ganglioglioma uh, which was enough to control her seizures and give us a diagnosis. And she was referred in wanting to know if we could get a gross total resection of this tumor without hurting her. So her MEG suggested that all of her language was tightly uh, localized right around the corticotomy where they had partially resected her tumor. And here she is in TMS. These are the reflective headband that co-registers her. She'll see these pictures and then she has to name what she sees. And you'll hear the clicking, which is the digital magnetic stimulation transcutaneously. And when we stimulate over Broca's area, you'll, we'll precipitate speech arrest and you'll hear her language falter as she tries to name the pictures. Horse. And by doing this mapping, then um, our neurologist can generate a, a picture for us like this. Here's her tumor language tightly localized right around it. And based on this, we said, as long as her seizures are controlled, let's follow her and not do surgery. This is a, an article by uh, Mitch Berger's group comparing direct cortical stimulation to transcranial magnetic stimulation, suggesting that it's accurate to within a few millimeters. And this has turned out to be a very useful method for both motor mapping and for language mapping. So here's a child who presented with seizures and a left parietal tumor. First seizure uh, last November and then another episode, uh, a CT scan showing a heav heavily calcified tumor and an MRI suggesting a uh, slow-growing neoplasm. So you'll see his MRI here, and you'll see how the tumor has thinned the inner table of the calvarium here, which is a fe radiographic feature of benign neoplasm, heavily calcified tumor. And here's his TMS showing that his language was pushed posterior to the tumor, uh, probably in the region of arcuate fasciculus, angular gyrus. Here's his tumor. We've coagulated the pia around it, and you can see us then opening the pia. And just like in the last tumor, uh, 
uh, following the boundaries and dissecting the pia of the normal brain away from the pia of the tumor, trying to do most of our manipulation in the tumor and trying to leave the uh, normal brain alone as much as possible. Then interposing cotinoids as we work around the tumor, trying to preserve the peel ves vasculature on the side of the normal brain, but take it away from the side of the tumor itself. And what's uh, notable about this particular case is he has a significant uh, on passage cortical vessel going through the tumor. You can see it's dissecting away, taking away the blood supply to the tumor, as you see here. Until we get down to the subcortical white matter. And uh, you can see this vessel running through the tumor going on to the functional brain beyond it. And we'd like to take the perforating vessels going to the tumor off of this artery, but to spare this artery so that we don't cause infarction of the normal brain around the tumor. And so by taking our time and just dissecting the tumor out, you can see us identifying the perforating vessels coming off of the main trunk, uh, coagulating them and cutting them. Here we're amputating where the tumor uh, uh, grows up uh, an adjacent gyrus. And uh, taking our time to take each of these perforating vessels going to the tumor, but sparing the parent artery. As you see here. and taking time to spare that vessel. Uh, you see the normal white matter at the depths of the tumor. And once we get to that level, we come across it, as you see, and can then take the tumor out. And uh, once again, we always want to take a biopsy of that white matter at the depths of our exposure so we can see if there's residual tumor there or not. But the importance of sparing the blood supply to the adjacent cortex when we take these tumors out. Here we're uh, taking out a remnant, as you see here, and again, preserving the vessel. And this is our resection cavity at the end of the case. And uh, he woke up with no language deficits. Here's his post-operative scan. Uh, low-grade astrocytoma. So this is a little bit more difficult case. This is a larger malignant tumor in a 27-year-old who presented with uh, seizures, new onset seizures, unfortunately, three weeks after he finished law school, but before he started his job. So unfortunately, he had no health insurance. But you see a large dominant tumor involving the frontal operculum, and you'd say, well, we can do this awake, but uh, with our functional mapping, we felt like we didn't need to. In this case, it was large enough. We used a picket fence technique in which we used our frameless stereotaxy to guide catheters around the border of the tumor down to the depths of the tumor. And then we cut the catheters off flush with the cortex so that if there's any settling of the brain, any shift as we work, the catheters uh, tell us the relationship between the surface of the brain and the depth of the tumor. And we can follow these catheters down to the uh, depth of the catheter and know when we get to the limits of the tumor if it's starting to blend with uh, adjacent brain. You see it's taking the catheter out as we work circumferentially around the tumor. In this case, it extended down to the uh, sylvian fissure involved the frontal operculum. We took one intraoperative MRI that suggested we still had significant residual. So we went back and took more out and uh, 
you can see in most, most instances, the tumor tissue is visually and texturally distinct from the internal capsule, but in, in some areas it was difficult to tell. So this is his post-operative MRI showing a large resection involving the frontal operculum. And uh, here he is two weeks post-operatively of his post-op follow-up visit. Play the piano? You can good. see no Show facial weakness, good fine motor good. coordination. Your hands down. Can you count to 10 for me? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So not perfect speech. He still has some motor uh, uh, apraxia with his tongue, but quite serviceable speech. Unfortunately, this came back as an anaplastic astrocytoma, but uh, demonstrating that if you can preserve the empissage vessels to the brain around it, you can resect most of these tumors without deficit. Here's another case of a 17-year-old who came to us with a one-month history of progressive difficulty with talking, clumsiness in his dominant right hand, and uh, two to three weeks of worsening headaches, a single spell of what was probably a, com a complex partial seizure, and a large malignant tumor here in the dominant uh, frontal, frontal temporal region looked like a glioblastoma to us and concerning because a lot of his middle cerebral branches coursed right through the tumor, which we knew we would have to preserve if we were going to preserve speech. In his case, uh, here you see these uh, major vascular uh, empissage vessels coming through the tumor and his transcranial magnetic stimulation demonstrate orthotopic, there's the omega sign for hand, speech area pushed posteriorly. So this is Sylvian Fisher. This is what normally you would say is frontal operculum, but this was tumor at the surface here. So getting into tumor, biopsy came back consistent with a high-grade glial neoplasm. And then identifying the Sylvian vessels uh, as they come into the tumor anteriorly, and taking care to dissect out the perforators coming off of those vessels, taking the blood supply to the tumor, but preserving those vessels as we work through the tumor uh, to resect it. And just in the interest of time to move along here, you can see the middle cerebral branches here. Uh, we're preserving those, taking branches off of it, as you see here, preserving those vessels as we resect the tumor. Here's an area of hemosiderin staining from where the tumor had hemorrhaged into itself. And intraoperative MRI showed some residual, so we went back and resected some superior temporal gyrus as well, where tumor was involved. But again, uh, sparing those important vessels uh, from the middle cerebral that go to the surrounding brain. A while ago. This is him and, um, five days post-operatively. I really don't know what to say now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. What do you call this here? A pen. And what about this? A watch. Great. What do you do with this? Just wear it. Look at it. Okay. Can you hold your arms down in front of you? Palms up to the ceiling. And close your eyes. Keep your hands there. Take this from you. You can touch your nose with your index finger. Come back out. Stand on the other side. Great. You can open your eyes. Can you move your toes for us? Great. And can you stand up and just walk back and forth once or twice? Great. Come on back. And here's his post-operative scan showing preservation of those vessels in the resection cavity. So unfortunately, that came back to glioblastoma, and he's gone on to adjuvant therapy. But uh, so far, neurologically, he's, he's enjoyed a good outcome from the surgery. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, we have a number of invasive, uh, non-invasive means of, of mapping cortical function. Um, not time to talk about high gamma activity and its localization ability, but something that we're working on in young children as well. So in children who are too young to cooperate for things like awake craniotomy, we found ways uh, that we can 
address their tumors quite adequately with non-invasive functional mapping and with good uh, abilities to resect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Boop. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, um, and uh, the, the, uh, the um, technology and the surgery that combines to produce the specific surgery is impressive. I just want to open questions to the um, attendee audience. Um, I'm just going to uh, unmute uh, the um, microphones. You can please let me know who wants to ask questions. Otherwise, just uh, type into the chat uh, anyone who wants to ask questions. I'm just going to unmute. Sometimes there will be Dr. Gold, do you have any questions for Dr. Boop? Dr. Turan? Can you hear me, everyone? Any questions for Dr. Yeah. Uh, Professor Gold, any questions for Professor Boop? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, you can. Okay, Fred, that was a great uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure many of those who are watching you must have learned to learn. I want to know if you want to use a dye or another, if necessary, because you don't show this use of this dye in malignant tumor. Do you think they are essential or do you think are you repeat the question and they couldn't understand. I am wondering if you want, if you like the use of AE dye for the use of malignant tumors. You're getting a lot of echoes, so it's hard for me to understand what you're saying, Atul. Can you interpret for me, Nara? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm just going to un unmute. I'm going to mute all and then unmute Dr. Professor Gold. That might be that might be a way. Dr. Gold, could you please uh, repeat that question for me, please? I have I've only opened your microphone at the moment. No, my question is for malignant tumors. Do you have intraoperative some kind of maneuvering to? find out if there is some residual tumor or not? Do you use some ala dye or some kind of other dyes to find out if you have left some residual tumor behind? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Atul. And, and as you know, there are a number of centers that are using 5-ALA or fluorescein to look for residual tumor. In my practice, uh, I generally take care of children and in our country, 5-ALA is only approved for 18, 18 years old and older. So we rely on interoperative MRI uh, to look at residual tumor and have found that very effective in, in reducing our need to return to surgery for residual tumor. Uh, the, the year before we got our intraoperative MRI, our, our habit up until that time was to finish surgery, do an MRI the day afterwards, and if we had residual tumor, bring the children back and reoperate to get it out. Uh, we did that in 8% of the children the year before our intraoperative MRI. The first year we had the intraoperative MRI, that dropped to 2% and the next year to 1%. So now it's very unusual for us to have to take children back to surgery for residual tumor because we, we can do a scan at the time. Of surgery. Professor Toure, do you have any questions for Dr. Boop? Uh, 
I'm trying to unmute you. I'm not, I'll unmute everyone. Dr. Tudor. Um, Dr. Boop, uh, can I ask you a question? Um, in, in terms of um, awake surgery, what's the youngest age, uh, what's the youngest age uh, uh, the, of patient that you have operated on with awake surgery or do you go with surgery at all? Um, we, we rarely will do with, with these adjuncts. I can do motor mapping with the children of sleep, uh, both cortical and subcortical stimulation. I can do sensory mapping. Uh, and really, the only thing that we need to wait for the me first is expressive speech, but with transcranial magnetic stimulation, I'm generally comfortable uh, with the mapping and the children doing that and not having to do it with them. Thank you. Dr. Marek Mandela, do you have any questions for Dr. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. And my question is, do you have any experience with ultrasound uh, during surgery, intraoperative ultrasound, comparing it to MRI? And I don't routinely use it, but I think it's a very effective real-time tool. And... Uh, those who have proper ultrasound, that's an excellent adjunct for, for particularly cortical tumor resection. Okay, thank you. And do you think, is there any place for awake craniotomy in blood manipulation? In my practice, I haven't had a lot of years. Okay, thank you. Yes, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions for Dr. B? Uh, can can you please uh, uh, just a second? Can you please uh, send through the chat box any questions? Does that way I can read it out? Uh, um, so, Doctor Boop, I've got a question for you from Doctor Luciano Furlanetti uh, from UK. Uh, the question is: um, Is there a minimum age for speech mapping with? Uh, RTMS, how, re how reliable would it be in four-year-old? On the other hand, what would be a minimum age to proceed with awake surgery in children? Yeah. Well, it depends on the, uh, on the patient regarding their ability to cooperate with awake surgery. Sometimes even in impaired adults, you can't do it. Um, so uh, typically, if you look at Mitch Berger's large publication series in New England Journal of Medicine, they use 10 years of age as a cutoff for awake craniotomy in children. Um, I don't do awake craniotomies. We've used these other modalities to map them out so that I felt comfortable not doing it. Um, regarding language mapping with TMS, the youngest we've done is in a three-year-old child, um, having him talk and then just uh, being able to interrupt his talking to his mother while he's sitting in his mother's lap. But that's one case in a very cooperative child. Normally, five or six years of age is, is, is the, the youngest that we can do TMS in. But we can do uh, passive Wernicke's, passive receptive speech mapping with Meg down to one year of age. Um, and that's about as young as we've tried it. Um, that's it. Thank you. There's a question from Dr. Jitin Bajaj from India. He's asking what amount of neuroplasticity can be harnessed in children? That's an excellent question. Um, Hughes Defau has, has published that in adults with low-grade tumors that oftentimes they will 
over time move some of their language from one hemisphere to another and to be patient with some of those low-grade gliomas to allow that to happen. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell for me um, how much that happens beyond infancy. Uh, typically, even when we have preservation of speech in children who've had tumors in language areas, it's not normal speech. They may be able to say words or phrases, but it's not normal speech like you and I have here. If it's, if it's motor speech, typically that will recover. Tongue and face have bilateral innervation. Um, but if it's a Broca's uh, premotor type speech, then oftentimes they still don't have normal language. Thank you. Um, a question from me. I think one of the criticism of tractography was that it's statistical and it's not accurate enough. Oh, I, I'm sure you have covered it. What's your experience with tractography? Uh, how accurate do you find it? Uh, I think that technology improves over time. Um, and I don't think you can absolutely rely on it. Uh, but I think if you have tractography plus a good knowledge of microsurgical anatomy, um, that that can be helpful uh, for motor motor. Uh, corticospinal tracts, those can be stimulated in the asleep patient, both cortically and subcortically. And so uh, with our intraoperative MRI, I'll also add that an intraoperative DTI is a three minute sequence and we can see exactly where the tracts are on DTI and can actually measure how much tumor we have, how many millimeters of tumor we have. Uh, before we get to corticospinal tracts and we can update our frameless ferret taxi so that um, we account for shift using intraoperative MRI. For me, that's been the most useful thing. That's brilliant. Um, just one more question. I'll just unmute it again, all and see if there's any questions. Um, Dr. Boop, uh, my final question to you, uh, in, how do you see um, and the technology uh, improving in the next five years? Uh, where do you see uh, further advancement coming? Well, um, I think there are a number of things that are happening in in neurosurgery and in neuroscience that make for an exciting future. Um, as you know, in our country, the FDA has recently approved seven Tesla MRIs, and the imaging that we're seeing on 7T MRI uh, in terms of tractography and fiber tracking are unbelievably uh, sophisticated. Uh, I think that these functional modalities that we're using, we're learning more about high gamma is a high frequency uh, electrical activation that is regionally specific and task specific in the cortex. It's too low voltage and too fast to record from MEG transcutaneously, but from GRIDS, for example, we can map out young children using high gamma activation for speech and motor activities, even when they're unable to cooperate for any kind of functional paradigm. So I think that's something that's coming in the future. And then finally, just a better understand of the, understanding of the molecular underpinnings of some of these low-grade tumors. Uh, the trials are ongoing, but we've all had anecdotal cases of, of residual tumors like an ID1 mutated tumor that may melt away with targeted therapies. And so uh, advanced understanding of of what causes these tumors to grow and what can be used to make them shrink, I think will will be our future. I just got a question from Dr. Victoria Testa. Uh, she's asking, does the intraoperative pathological anatomy help you define a, help help helps you define a more or less extensive uh, excision? Yes, um, the intraoperative MRI is very very. Uh, sensitive to residual tumor. Uh, where we found that it's not so helpful is we always do an intraoperative DTI sequence to see if we've had any uh, vascular injury to the surrounding brain. 
and we've had a number of cases where the intraoperative MRI looks fine, but postoperatively the patient has a new deficit over the first 24 or 48 hours. And when we repeat the uh, postoperative MRI, we may see DTI changes that we didn't see on the intraoperative MRI. Thank you. Um, and there's another qu uh, question from Dr. Jacinda Fran Francis from Malaysia. Is, is there a role for intraoperative neuromonitoring SSP, especially SSP in these children as an adjunct? Uh, absolutely. Um, we can look for uh, measuring phase reversal across the uh, post-central sulcus with uh, strip electrodes by stimulating median nerve, tibial nerve, uh, and that's very useful when we're looking at parietal activation. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Boop. It really has been um, a fascinating talk and uh, certainly has given us all ideas on how to go about uh, approaching these uh, tumors in eloquent areas. Um, just two uh, uh, matters to mention. I have recorded this uh, uh, lecture, so I hope that later today that I will be able to send you a link so you can review the lecture. I always find reviewing the lectures very, very useful. Um, and I also thank everyone who uh, attended this uh, lecture and uh, I hope you will all join us for the uh, next meeting. Thank you very much to Dr. Boop again and to everyone. Um, thank you for putting together this whole series. It's very useful. Brilliant. Uh, I'm just going to ask you. I look to seeing you all again at the next meeting. Send you a feedback from as well. I hope that you will be kind enough to complete it, which will be useful for future meetings. Bye for now. Have a good good day and a good week ahead.